Uh, first, welcome everyone. I appreciate y'all being here, and you know, we've this is what about the fourth, fifth year, fifth year that that we've done this, and each time it gets a little more fine tuned, and and uh, but I think we've learned over that time that even though we know not every item gets funded, that it's a great opportunity to listen to what your your peers have to say and and learn something from it, and. Uh, maybe build off each other and maybe we've, we've had a lot of people over the years get together and uh, you know they hear one idea and they and think of it they get together after and maybe come up with a way to get some things done um, a different way with that said let me talk just a minute about the uh, the schedule um, first of all everyone there's agendas around that have the times please before you come up uh, and Jeanette over here has some more if you don't have one. Uh, just be aware of where you are on the list and what your time limit is. We're not going to blow a horn or anything, but just <laughs> be, be aware of, of your time frame and, and try and, and stay within it. Um, we said early on that PowerPoints were not necessary. If you have one and it's attached to your uh, template, we will just have it. It will just be open. What we need you to do, though, because we're going to be switching back and forth on the computers, is if you're do going to use a PowerPoint, when you're coming up, come by the table so we can give you the right clicker. We wouldn't want you up here clicking and <laughs> have nothing work. Okay. Um, as far as the, the time frame goes, we're going to have a break about 1030, 1030-ish. Uh, there is coffee, water in the back, but we will be serving lunch, and so we'll break um, right around noontime to have lunch. So you'll see lunch start to come in about 11.30. So if we're a little ahead of schedule, we'll, we'll kind of arrange if we need to start a little bit early, we will. Uh, remember, too, that this is just the beginning of the process. So it, that's why we don't have you get up and show all the data and all the documentation that going forward, we will have the strategic committees will meet, the three strategic committees will meet, they will review all the requests uh, we At times, we've even gone back and reviewed the video if we needed to. Uh, recommendations will go through those committees. They will, we, they will ultimately go to the Strategic Issues Committee. We will approve a, a final budget. Uh, essentially, what we've done in the past, and it works, I think, fairly well, is we've, we don't know the revenue that we'll have right now. But as the legislature, as that process goes on, we will get more and more information. But we will prioritize all the requests. And then when we, get, when we see what the funding is, then typically we've then gone in and said, okay, what, what of those priorities are we able to fund? And, and then we'll notify you. We will keep the SharePoint site up to date every time a committee meets or makes recommendations or notes. You can go to the site and, and look at the latest information. So with that, why don't we get started? Uh, I believe Stan, you, I don't know if you're coming up individually or you're going to bring everybody Great. Well, good morning. I'm Stan Vitito. I'm provost of the Clearwater campus. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation this morning. Um, the college experience, as you know, is the SPC's uh, flagship student success initiative. It's received uh, national attention, I think, is on its way to being uh, a national model for improving student success. The Council of Campus Provosts have been heavily involved in the college experience and its five components. And today you're going to hear some requests in support of expanding and finalizing some of the components of that initiative. Um, the first of those is the uh, expanded student orientation. And we have a set of goals here to look at. Uh, each one of these will have a request. Uh, where we're clicking. There we go. Uh, the first thing you're going to hear about is the expanded.
podium over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Oliver, Provost of the Seminole Campus. Thank you, Dr. Vitito, um, and thank you for entertaining this request uh, this morning. Uh, the first of the college experience requests is in the area of the uh, extended orientation of what we're now calling the Smart Start Orientation uh, Initiative. Um, this planning is already well underway for uh, this initiative, um, which replaces the current orientation and extends it by enrolling all first-time, full-time associate degree students in a five-module course taught before classes begin and during those critical first four weeks of the semester. The um, initiative will get underway in the fall of, of 2015. Um, you'll learn more details, most of you, um, at the spring training session. There'll be a session about that tomorrow afternoon. Um, we're asking for $106,650 uh, for this uh, component. Most of that funding um, is for, the, um, it's for uh, OPS support. You see it, Tarpon and Seminole and Clearwater. Each provost will determine uh, how they will train uh, and, and staff the, the Smart Start initiative um, and the sections of the initiative and to work for with the Smart Start orientation and the retention efforts. But um, the determination has been made on those sites that uh, that's how the process will work. That's the vast majority of the funding, $85,650. Um, there's also funds uh, requested for marketing materials to promote this initiative, but also other outreach initiatives uh, and the cost of recruiting materials as the function of recruiting shifts somewhat to the sites, uh, and MPI looks to the sites for recruiting uh, expenses. Uh, we've asked for $3,000 per site uh, for the seven sites, $21,000 for that purpose. We also recognize that there'll be costs for developing curriculum materials, both face-to-face -face and online, but no funds are requested for that purpose because we believe that uh, Susan Cleric, Dr. Cleric, who's offering a lot of support in that area and the Title III program will provide us the support that we need. So other costs will be, um, are outlined, um, or the details are outlined in the SSO document which is attached to your materials. Um, and now we will turn uh, for a discussion on the um, strengthening out of class support to Dr. Bright, or improving retention. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, we're looking at $40,092 to uh, improve areas of retention. Um, one area is a full-time staff assistant to support the Student Success Support Center at Seminole, and also looking to convert uh, one of the OPS staff members, Student Affairs Assistant, uh, to full-time at HCC, HEC. You guys want to add anything to that? Bill, you're next. Okay. This is. No, the slides get switched. Okay. Okay, th this one is strengthening out of class support. We're asking for almost $30,000 here um, to add a staff assistant for disability resources at Tarpon Springs. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the past year is, is an increase in, in, in the need for accommodations for students. So uh, purpose for that one is, and the second one is to increase OPS staff to support online proctor testing. Um, another large area that we've seen a dramatic increase over the past year is in proctor testing. So as we go forward with that, th there is a great need for that. Stop in place. This is exactly what I don't want. Okay. Tell me how the next dollar is going to make the changes. Don't tell me the staffing needs. I have no idea what $29,000 will do except to provide another position. Okay. That's not what I, if that's what you want to ask for, that's okay. Okay. But that's not going to move me. This is exactly what I don't want. What would you like to do? For example, the um, area of disability resources at Tarpon Springs, it functioned out of a one office room environment. We had one staff member basically focusing on accommodations. Uh, we have expanded the mission of those resources, moving more so to take more responsibility of a caseload of those students who are receiving appropriate accommodations. So 
not just focus on the one area of the accommodations, but also now working on completing the MLPs, monitoring the students, being on a caseload. We've also moved some of the testing out of the testing center where all of the students were coming for the accommodations. Now we're able to accommodate uh, that testing in an area that was created for a disability resources area. Um, with that moving some of those operations, it begins to reduce the wait times during peak times. Now we can shift resources and give students more comprehensive services that are, uh, are in need for uh, disability accommodations. And for online proctor testing. No, 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 I'm sorry, Jim. We're not going through every one okay. and have, have speeches, okay? The, the details I, are I, in the document of why, of why that request is made. If this is the presentation you want to make, we're going we're gonna to engage on this, okay? This is not the way this. We should have had, here's where we are on the thing. Here are the areas of, of high need. Here are the next steps to improve areas we think are there. If it's wait times, Marvin, then we should have a, a, a a process that says wait times are one of our key things. Here's what the wait times look like. Here's what we're doing. Here's what the next dollar does to address that need. That would have been a presentation that I would be interested in. Getting a litany of staff requests, a Christmas list of litany of staff requests, does nothing to move me. Okay, so um, if you guys want to uh, drop back and rethink it, that's okay. If you want to, let's let's do the whole thing so that everybody's got a chance to put their requests online. Um, poorly received. Okay, so th this particular uh, piece here is regarding our student coaching system. And it's something that we have implemented over the past three years, which, which we believe um, is used by all of the advisors. Um, and, and the request here is, number one, is, is to maintain the level of support that we have from the vendor of, of the product. So, so we, we, we use this for early alerts, we use this to advise students. We will be moving forward in, in a couple of months to use the piece in the student coaching system to make all of the notes on students so that anyone who has access to the coaching system will be able to see the notes. So the notes that we've currently been making in, in who's next are being migrated over and, and our staff will just use the student coaching system to make notes. And so we think that we will make this a, an easier um, or, or a one-stop shop to see information about students. So as students go on and, and they're, they're advised at Tarpon or they're advised at Seminole, um, we think that this will, will be able to tie that all together. Um, the second piece to this is upgrades and enhancements. As we go forward, um, with, with uh, my courses, we, we currently have our connection to my courses, but we want to enhance that so it's a smoother transition from the early, uh, from my courses into the early alert screens. So, so that's what we wanted to do with, with, with enhancements. We've started a help desk for the student coaching system for both uh, faculty who are using the early alerts and um, for staff that are using the early alerts. And, and so we have that supported by a, by a part-time OPS person that, that, that has been working there for about, a, about a, almost a year now. And so we would like to continue that. So all of this, we believe, supports our mission towards uh, uh, improving retention and advising students. Good morning. Tyrone Clinton, Associate Provost at the Midtown Campus. Um, talking about the new and improved uh, advising model. Students' first point of contact with St. Petersburg College typically comes in our registration centers. Advisors, along with a litany of other staff members in the area, play pivotal roles in the successes of our students. Like SPC, the position has evolved. Responsibilities include the following shown on the first bullet, recruitment, re registration, advising, retention, graduation, career counseling, etc. Not limited to those, but also including financial aid, early alerts, learning plan, a litany of things advisors are asked to perform. With this evolution in this position, and changes in their responsibilities, it's necessary to strategically reorganize their workflows. 
in a more streamlined manner. <clears throat> During non-peak times, we're proposing that advisors focus on one of the three areas seen in the first bullet. <clears throat> in addition, we're requesting an upgrade in the position for student support advisor from a career level six to a and one to support this need. To lead these three areas, we're also requesting um, the creation of seven new coordinator positions um, elevated to a and level four in the three areas that you see again in the first bullet. These coordinator positions would provide opportunities for several staff members to develop their leadership skills. And with that, I'll go pass this over to Mr. Davis, who's going to talk <clears throat> about some strategic ways we're going to help our registration center. Thank you. Thanks, Tyrone. Good morning. Uh, one of the areas that we're looking to reduce some wait times uh, in the advising areas that will significantly cut down the wait times is to look at re-engineering the document process. A lot of the students come in, they drop off documents to be scanned in, the documents are transferred and shipped to another area. They have to scan those in. It takes uh, a long time. Uh, if we had that scanning technology and software capabilities on campus, we'd be able to, to do this a little bit faster and reduce the wait time significantly. We're asking for 89472 uh, the software and the scanners uh, take up most of the chunk in, in that budget request, but we're also asking to revise the registration process. We are already doing some cost-effective measures right now on campus that will significantly reduce the wait times. We're looking at appointments, uh, advisors bringing in students that, um, that come in during the latter part of the area, during the middle part of the semester. And we're also looking at texting students and better ways to communicate with them, to get them in, get them serviced in an area that's in the time where it's not so busy, and then sort of move them out. Thank you. As we finalize the expansion of career services on our campuses, this request is for uh, two internship coordinators for the downtown, midtown, and Clearwater campuses. As we ramp up the career services that we're providing for students as they come into our campuses, and as we ask advisors to be highly engaged in that career process, the internship coordinators have become an integral part of that three-prong approach to advising, uh, providing uh, career jobs and stuff, and providing uh, placement into internships for our students. So this request is for uh, 86000 for two positions at the downtown, midtown, and Clearwater campuses. That concludes our request. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Good morning, I'm Pat Renard, Associate Vice President for Enrollment Services, reporting to uh, Dr. Williams. She's not able to be with us this morning, and she asked me to uh, present her request on, on her behalf. My only uh, condition was, as long as it was before Joe Leopold, I said yes. Uh, Dr. Williams is requesting a, a new position. It is a Student Services Project Coordinator in her office. Uh, for those of you that know uh, Dewan Fox, it's a similar position to that Dewan holds in academic affairs, and this position would uh, coordinate uh, special projects and projects uh, outside of the scope of the college experience primarily, and would serve as a, a person to plan and implement um, projects uh, in the community. For example, um, every year Dr. Williams hosts a minister's dinner. So it would be someone that she could hand that type of a project to and, and make sure that it got done uh, to her standards. And this would be a level four A&P position. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks. I have two requests for the Clearwater campus. 
Uh, the first is upgrades to our Fine Arts Auditorium. Uh, the Fine Arts Auditorium supports uh, student programs, theater, dance, as well as a number of events and programs uh, college-wide. It's also a focal point for the community. Uh, activities ranging from community band to public policy forums are held in this venue because it's one of the few larger venues in mid-county. Um, it's a very serviceable auditorium, um, but uh, it has, after 50 years, uh, required some upgrades. And we have begun changing out some of the seats in there. Uh, there are about 525 seats. Um, we've been using some provost discretionary money uh, to begin that process. The request today is to complete the replacement of all the seats to uh, repair some of the items that are uh, in the floor that need work, and also to repaint uh, the inside of the auditorium. Uh, the request is uh, for next year's budget, however, it would be very timely since we're going to close the auditorium this summer uh, for repairs to the HVAC system to be able to do some of this this summer. A second request is made in conjunction with Dean Chapin and on behalf of the science faculty on campus who seek to expand the marine biology lab on campus. Um, we're not asking uh, at this point to, for the funding to build the lab, but simply for funding to explore the feasibility. Uh, the idea would be that this could add as much as 500 uh, square feet to the marine biology lab. It's a fairly small lab, and with the number of students we have now, it's getting pretty crowded. Uh, we think this might be a relatively inexpensive way uh, to add some additional science labs uh, on the Clearwater campus. Thank you. Stan, stay there for a second. Doug, both of these requests, but take them in order. Wouldn't, wouldn't the first one come out of the capital improvement fee? I mean, don't we have ongoing commitments to major renovation or renovations generally? Yeah, I think most of what you'll see on here are ones that are go beyond the capacity of the local budgets. I'm just trying to get to source funds. I'm happy to have the request. I think it's a, a very legitimate request. I'm just, are we, I'm confused. Are we taking capital requests as well today or just fund one requests? We said any. Got it. Any okay. Day, Thanks. Good enough. Thank you. Uh, Stan, is the, is the preliminary work done on this? I mean, if we, if we want to cut this thing loose for the summer, how, to, to, how much work Remake. We, we've identified um, the vendor for the seats. We've done some review of different chairs and things. Um, it, it should be ready to pull the trigger. We, all we have to do is tell the vendor we want more than the 100 seats which we're purchasing now. Can we, um, uh, without delaying the rest of the project, how about if we take a look at that lobby too and see if there isn't a coat of paint or some other things that would make that look like it's in the 21st century? Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Phil Nicotero, Provost of the Health Education Center, and I am here on behalf of the deans and the program directors of all of our allied health programs. Um, in the past 18 months, we've seen a decline in the number of clinical spaces available for our students, and we want to be ahead of the curve here is, and the reason why we've seen this decline, a little bit of background here, is that we've, we've seen approximately a three-fold increase in the number of health programs in our community, both publicly funded programs, private uh, nonprofit programs as well. They have increased the level of competition for clinical spaces. Um, Combined with, with that is the clinical facilities um, are, are really looking at patient safety, um, and they are also graded on um, patient satisfaction. And, and so coming forward in the next year, hospitals will receive some funding based on patient satisfaction surveys. And, and so with that in mind, the more that they have to deal with students and, and their staff has to devote time to those students, they would prefer to devote more time to the patients. And also, also there's the factor of patient safety there. 
So they have asked us to decrease the number of students that we send. And so that, that requires us to go out and try to find alternative clinical sites. Um, the other factor in our healthcare community in this county is that in, in the past couple of years, we've seen significant management changes in some of the larger hospital systems. And, and when I say that, I mean that uh, hospitals have brought in management decision makers that have an effect on us that are from outside of our community. And so, so they are not as familiar with the good work that we do at St. Petersburg College and, and the quality students that, that we, we, we educate and put out into the workforce. And so my request here is I think, it's, I think we're at a crossroad where we always need to be in the minds and, and sitting with those at clinical facilities um, on a constant basis. So my request here is to, is to really fund a position for a clinical liaison who would, who would continually be out in the community garnering more clinical spaces for our students, uh, for all of our programs. So uh, my second request builds upon this, and, and that is, as, as you know, every year I, I stand up here for the, the physical therapy assisting clinic. Um, and since I've been here, it's always been a vision of mine to make the Health Education Center uh, a more comprehensive uh, center, including more clinics. Well, the reason why I did this second is because this we have a model already at the Health Education Center, our dental clinic, which really serves as a clinical site for our dental students. And, and, and to help us relieve what I just talked about in the previous request is a PTA clinic would allow us to do a significant amount of, of clinical uh, practice right on site. And we would be able to do that with our own uh, uh, college community, with our athletes. And if we wanted to eventually, we, we would be able, like we do at the dental clinic, be able to open that up to the public. And so that would be my request is what we would need is a physical therapist on site to manage the clinic. Now, now that position would also be able to work with our students in the lab during our open lab periods or our out of classroom support time um, with the uh, physical therapy students. Phil, you're yes. comfortable that uh, when, when we made what I thought were modest increases in the role of orthotics and prosthetics yeah. to expand the number of certificates or whatnot, the blowback from that community was surprising. They right. wanted no part of it. I mean, I had to yeah. give personal assurances that we were not going to erode their businesses. They had no confidence that we weren't competing against them. Are, are we going to see the same thing from the PTs? I don't believe so, Dr. Law, for the simple reason is our advisory board, we've, as you know, we've presented this for, for a few years now, and, and we've always run it by our advisory board. Our advisory board for the physical therapy assisting program are all practitioners in the area working at various facilities, and really the number of patients that we would be seeing would be very, very small. It, it, uh, so. Uh, we have not heard, we've heard encouragement okay. versus blowback. From, I, I think two different, two different medical communities is, okay. I think, what we have. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. I have two requests for uh, downtown Midtown this morning. Uh, the first is for a campus recruiter. Uh, and this position will assist us in developing the uh, downtown midtown ecosystem. Uh, as we begin that work, uh, this person would help us in going out into the community, making contact and developing partnership with schools, uh, the churches, uh, and other areas where we can begin to build that ecosystem from the elementary school to the high school, being able to develop um, Mentoring, mentoring programs for the students at the high schools, uh, being able to set up and develop the visits to the schools, much like they're doing at Seminole. So this request is to have a person on board uh, to develop that for the, the many schools in, in the South St. Petersburg that we hope to service through this, uh, 
request. Next one. Kevin, aren't, don't, don't we have a, an alternative strategy? Aren't, didn't we centralize positions in Diana's budget to carry out these functions and, and there were, get that organized? Um, there were three positions that came out of that, um, which are geographically for mid-north and south. Uh, but there was also, there's also going to be a disbursement of um, several positions once we develop the uh, uh, Roll, uh, disperse with the uh, call center, uh, and then there are some positions for that are going to go out to the campuses. Uh, downtown Midtown was not one of those. Thank you. And this request uh, is for um, some assistance for the uh, academic chair positions uh, that are going to be coming on board for the the downtown Midtown campuses. That we've grown over the last three years from a, a faculty of five to over 20 full-time. Um, we've also increased our academic chairs from, from zero to five. So in order to be able to provide the um, administrative support for them, this request is for an administrative assistant. Any questions? Thank you. Good morning, uh, Marvin Bright, Provost of the Tarpon Springs campus. I'm going to be making four uh, requests. The first request is just minimal funding for the implementation of the college's ecosystem uh, in the Northern Pinellas County area through Tarpon Springs campus. Uh, this minimal funding will be utilized to cultivate relationships and begin to continuously nurture those relationships with public and private K through 12 schools. Uh, adult education programs, for example, GED. I've been meeting quite frequently with them. I'm trying to do a seamless process where once completion of that GED, we can move them into certificates and or AS degree programs. And finally, working with uh, business and industry so that we can actually develop a seamless process of college and career readiness pathways uh, in the area. Uh, the second request, um, is an audio system upgrade for the Lyceum Auditorium. Um, currently, the system is not adequate in providing optimal sound quality. Um, the auditorium is highly used. It's used for classroom instruction. Um, it's also used for conferences that we actually conduct in the Tarpon Springs area. So we just needed to get it up to a, an actual standard of sound. Number three. Number three is also in the Lyceum. Um, coming in, there were some broken seats. It just the facilities itself, the room just needs to be upgraded to the standard of quality that we want to offer to our public and also offer to our student and staff um, for doing workshops and things in that area. Number three, four. Number four um, is a request that is an extension to the career the integrated career in academic advising. What we're looking at to do is to touch every first time in college student, um, focusing on careers. We do a pretty good job at it. Um, I just think that we need to be more, provide more rigorous services for students. Right now, the majority of all of our workshops, the touching students for us career and transfer are conducted in classrooms uh, when they're available or in makeshift hallways. Um, with this conversion of New Tech 460, it is a highly visible, highly interactive area uh, where students can actually come in, uh, get extensive career exploration, identifying career paths, creating their paths to their career. But at the same time, those students uh, that have 45 credits or more, uh, they can get hands-on, self-directed information on how to transfer. Um, one of the goals that we want to do, again, is to touch every first time in college student, not just at the front door, but all during their time when they're enrolled at classes. Um, with this area, um, it is slated to increase our retention and also create, uh, even increase our graduation of students going into careers. Thank you. 
Um, Marvin, are, are there going to be four or five other requests like that? I mean, yours is not the only career center, right? Uh, where is that project in, in, who knows, Jim or somebody help me out here? I mean, we're not doing one career center, we're going to do them all, aren't we? Or what's happening? Yes. Are, are there other, I didn't look through the list, are there, are there other requests like yours? Uh, on no, Dr. Law, this is an ex extension to that. Right now, the way in which we're configured at Tarpering Springs, we do provide that career and integrated advising, but this interactive area will be an extension. I mean, really more intensive hands-on. All of our outreach now is actually having our advisors to go to the classrooms. Uh, outreach as far as phone calls, outreach as far as emails. This is a strategy as a pilot that now we can actually have faculty members connect them with faculty members to bring students to this interactive hub. Um, workshops will be going on every day. Uh, students will be able to engage in self-directed learning at that point in time. Right now, currently, all of our, our resume workshops, our interview training workshops are done in a uh, classroom when that classroom is available. When we bring employers to the campus at Tarpon Springs, they're actually in the hallway of the fine arts area. This area that we can create is highly visible, um, constant interaction every day. And in fact, uh, Dr. Law, it is an observation that has been happening in the Learning Resource Center. Uh, the culture of the Learning Resource Center has been infectious. We want to be able to implement that type of culture into an area that students, I mean, they come there and that's where they hang out. They get their tutoring, um, they do study groups in that area. I think that we can actually implement that type of culture in this interaction hub that students can get more resources, spend more time on getting that career, more time on getting information about where they want to transfer. So really, our advisors will be there with them, hands-on, but activities going on constantly all day long. Marvin, I had a chance to visit with you and Rod, and, and so I, I, I think you've done a really good job doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out the way through here today, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 55,000 is not an, an extraordinary number to do that. I'm gonna ask a question. So is Clearwater all set? Is Seminole all set? Is is everybody else all set and you're the only one left or? I believe we are the second in the career center build out. Correct. St. Pete Gibbs is all set. Marvin's is in process. The others, the answers you know about the law. Some of those will follow. Clearwater is 80% there with the final cut to be done. Correct. Um, same with town points. So, so Marvin's request, I believe, is above and beyond. A little, above and beyond. Just a little. It is. It is. Yeah. Well, Dr. Law, currently, again, we don't have an area where we can actually conduct those workshops. You know, the resume workshops, the um, how to dress for an interview, bringing employers in. This location is ideal to conduct that. We could conduct more, but also it gives us an opportunity to touch every student. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Scott Fronrath, and I'm the provost of the Allstate Center. I'm proud and privileged to present to you the Allstate Center's 2015-2016 strategic budget request. When I was presenting this budget request uh, to my team, I asked them, as we explore as a campus towards a college experience and a more robust interaction with our students, what initiatives can we do and bring to make our students more workforce ready? The requests that I'm bringing to you that I'm uh, requesting today are, are the response of those requests. The first, re uh, the first response is for the Fire Training Center. We're requesting $350,000 to replace, excuse me, actually to add 
self-contained breathing apparatus units. This is the units that actually the firefighters use on their day-to-day -day basis. This is an integral part of their workforce ready. Currently, you will see in the yellow is what they're using now. That's the yellow tanks. Those are hand-me-downs, those are donated, which have already been used by other fire departments, and we graciously have taken it. But we feel that we can do a better job by preparing our students for immediate role jobs from the time that they leave our academies into the time they actually enter the firehouses. And we feel that we can do a better job uh, by preparing our students there. The second request is, again, towards our workforce readiness initiatives. And this is for our, for our defensive tactics uh, lab room. This lab classroom serves as a multifaceted room for our current fire, uh, excuse me, uh, current police officers, our cadets. This is where they learned about self-defense. We feel that we can do a better job by, prever by preparing a, a quality classroom setting so that these future community providers have a place. As you can see right here, uh, it is actually bubbling up. It's torn, uh, it's peeling up, and it's, it's actually outlived its lifespan. We're asking to replace this at a cost of about $60,000. The life expectancy on this, well, obviously, uh, we're looking at where we can actually change it out. So this will be a cost effective, and our return on the investment uh, for this particular lab will be uh, profound in the future, as well as preparing our officers in a quality setting. The third request is, um, I don't believe I have a picture, nope. The third request is also for workforce readiness in our classroom settings, as well as our connection to the community. As I mentioned when I first started, the Allstate Center is really engaging into the college experience, but we're doing something else very, very fascinating. We're actually engaged into the community more than we ever have, and it has generated a lot of attention to our campus. As we start to outreach, this request is to replace the 350 seats that are in our Florida room. This Florida room is our multifaceted classroom, education center, instruction. It also serves as our ceremonial hall, our graduation hall, our student gathering area. We use this room quite often for everything. Unfortunately, the seating in there has seen its time. We've inherited uh, those chairs since the inception of 1988. It's very difficult. So these are hard leather chairs. They're steel-based, uh, and they have seen their wear and tear. We feel as a campus that we can do a better job by preparing this classroom, preparing this community outreach uh, area for our, for our citizens, our students, to have a better place. And we're asking for $42,000 to replace those, that seating there. Our final request is also uh, workforce readiness geared. And this is to improve uh, the current system. We're asking for $65,000 for a digital smart classroom. We're looking to add this digital interactive smart classroom to our campus. We as a college, as well as a campus, already have a great international connection. We also have a national approach that we feel that our local community will have a better option and a better opportunity to do a blended approach. This gives the students an opportunity to enrich themselves not only locally for career-based as well as preparing for their degrees or their next levels. This allows them to reach across internationals and learn, uh, as, uh, learn their areas. And we're looking to, for $65,000 for that. Uh, as you can see, the, the campus is excited. Um, we're excited for the next year, and we appreciate the time and for this request. Are there any questions? Thank you. Good morning. I'm here um, on behalf of a, of a wonderful venture that has been part of kind of a silent part for a while of the communications uh, program here at the uh, college. Um, PlumePoetry.com hosts one of the premier poetry anthologies internationally. The founder and editor uh, is Professor Danny Lawless, who has brought his energies and his uh, working relationship with many of the world's great poets to bring any number of them to St. Petersburg College. We have hosted Billy Collins, twice U.S. Poet Laureate, 
um, on March 23rd and 24th. Yes, this is an advertisement. We will be hosting Richard Blanco, who was the inaugural poet um, uh, for President Obama and has recently released a book of his memoirs, um, Growing Up in Miami. He will be here March 23rd and 24th, speaking in our libraries, uh, speaking also at the Palladium, and interacting with students in, in um, their classes as well. What this funding would do um, would defray the cost of managing the website, printing a plume poetry anthology each year with the college's logo and the acknowledgement of the college and, and the association of plume poetry with the college would appear on all plume materials, online and in print. The funding would also uh, support the travel of Professor Lawless to promote the journal in the name of St. Petersburg College and to participate in poetry readings. This request is for $10,000 and your consideration is asked for this morning. The second request that I have is, is due to the large number of students who are now enrolling in American Sign Language courses. As you may know, uh, foreign language is now required as part of the associate degree for students who are required to take it. That is, they have not had two years of a foreign language in high school. And many students opt to take American Sign Language. Um, some, of, some of you may have taken American Sign Language as part of your um, college training. Um, American Sign Language is very prevalent um, it, um, uh, also in, in daycare centers and preschools, as I am learning from my three-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter who, who signs uh, whenever she can. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, area of study, and students recognize this. We've had over the last three sessions, we've had 800 students enrolled in sign language classes. Now, these classes are C courses, so they do require a combined lecture and lab um, experience. Um, currently, we have been using lab fees to support OPS tutors, um, and we have one full-time specialist to support that program who's located on the Clearwater campus. So lab fees have been covering those OPS lab tutors to su supplement the hours on the Tarpon Springs, Seminole, and St. Petersburg Gibbs sites. This request for $33,000 is for a full-time lab specialist for American Sign Language to serve the growing number of, of classes. Uh, depending on the, the number of, of lab fees uh, for this coming year, um, some of that money could continue to offset the, court, um, the costs um, of um, not only helping to pay the OPS tutors, but possibly potentially fund part of this position as well. The lab specialists would liaise with American Sign Language faculty, visit classes, and design lab experiences, uh, in, including workshops, to provide the kind of supplemental instruction that is absolutely necessary for student success and integral to the, to the whole um, curriculum of language acquisition. Thank you for your consideration. Um, good morning. I'm John Chapin. I'm the Dean for Natural Sciences. Uh, I thought it would be useful since I'm in the science program to bring some of the outdoors inside today. So uh, this is uh, a picture of the tip of the peninsula at our site for Bay Pines. Uh, I'll be meeting with the architects tomorrow and the builders to come up with the uh, most recent design uh, of, of this uh, facility. So I don't have pictures of how it will look when it's finished, but I thought I would put a few in here about how it, how it looks supposed to look uh, or looks right now. <clears throat> to switch a little bit, uh, we are starting a new program that will be centered at Tarpon Springs uh, called the Biomedical Engineering Technology Program. I wanted to give you a few just uh, statistics that we know about the program. Uh, in this area, the demand for graduates will, in, in that particular field will increase 30 percent between now and uh, 2022, so in about uh, seven or eight years. 
Uh, if you look at all sorts of maintenance technicians, because the graduates of this program will be maintaining all of those wonderful electronic devices you encounter if you uh, have the fortunate or unfortunate experience of going to a medical facility, these are the folks that maintain them, calibrate them, instruct nurses how to use them. Uh, it's salaries of similar careers in other areas are about 20% lower than the opening salaries for people in this career. Uh, our graduates will earn salaries, average salaries of $45,000 in this area when they graduate. We currently have about 60 students uh, working on workforce non-credit uh, training that will articulate into the credit program which starts in the fall. Um, <clears throat> we need a, uh, a new learning laboratory and I apologize for the lousiness of this particular picture. Um, but what we're going to do is to take, take a, a room that's in the Billaracus building up at Tarpon. Uh, Dr. Bright and I have worked with the facilities folks a little bit on this. Uh, it's going to be what I would call a learning laboratory. It's not a classroom, it's not a laboratory, it's both all combined. Uh, these are people that need to learn how to do things with people and obviously need to practice that. So you can see we're going to have, if you look over here uh, in the upper right hand corner, <clears throat> we're going to have an equipment testing area where those students will learn to test equipment. We'll have a, uh, a mock surgical suite where they will learn to use the, the various equipment in a surgical environment as well as a specialty suite. And as you can see, we've got collaboration areas and we also have a classroom area. This, this facility uh, will support all the activities, uh, on-campus activities for this program. We estimate the equipment cost to be about $32,000. Uh, and the, the uh, construction cost, the remodeling cost is relatively inexpensive, somewhere between fifty and $75,000. Um, we believe we can get this done. Uh, the program starts in the fall, so hopefully uh, we will have this, if it's awarded, uh, have this ready to go no later than January. Um, <clears throat> because we're adding a new program to Tarpon Springs, uh, we are requesting an administrative specialist. Uh, we currently have sci 90 science classes uh, at Tarpon Springs serving 2,100 students and more than 20 faculty members full and part-time up there. We're adding a program that will probably bring an additional 60 to 100 students as well as 3 to 10 new part-time faculty and a lead uh, faculty member which has already been budgeted. Um, so <clears throat> we're looking to take the position now that is a, an administrative specialist position uh, that is split with two departments and adding a full-time one to support the current sciences program as well as the BMET program uh, at Tarpon Springs since it'll be a much more complicated uh, environment at that time. So that's uh, a request for a support person. At Seminole, <clears throat> we have a similar situation where we're growing uh, and interestingly if you uh, look at the enrollments and the number of classes, I, I took a look at three years ago uh, that fall of 2012 and compared with spring of 2015 one of the things I was surprised about is our online number of sections at, at the Seminole slash eCampus has decreased a bit, but what has happened is we've had to back off a little bit on some of the lab classes that were online. But the thing that's really dramatically increased at Seminole, if you notice, is the number of on-ground classes. Uh, we've increased almost 60% of on-ground classes or face-to-face -face classes at Seminole. And right now we're sharing a position uh, for support with the mathematics department, which is also a very large department. Uh, and I'm requesting that we, uh, we get uh, a full-time position to support the increased enrollments at Seminole. Uh, <clears throat> Midtown campus, I thought uh, you might, if you haven't seen it recently, at least like a little picture of it. Um, we uh, have obviously classes at downtown and adding classes at Midtown. Uh, I would like to request an uh, administrative support specialist, and I think uh, Kevin may have covered this as well, that we would share with the math department. And, and Nadia, who is the academic chair for math down there, and I have talked about this, and we, we feel that we can do this easily. Uh, we're going to have students, um, or excuse me, a support specialist for the chair. We're going to have students that are going to really go back and forth between those campuses. And I think uh, uh, having a support person that can kind of help the chairs keep track of those and the uh, various things that are associated with the increasing student enrollment would be helpful. At Midtown, we're also building two new science labs and a, a uh, support uh, space, as you can see in the middle. Uh, i like to call your attention to the arrangement of the laboratory benches in these, in these labs. 
Uh, we have designed these intentionally to discourage, um, how shall I say this gently, lecturing <clears throat> in a laboratory uh, by making the benches all in a circle and putting the faculty station in the middle so it would be very hard for people to stand there and flash PowerPoints and read them in a laboratory environment. So we're trying to make our laboratories even more uh, engaging and interactive and students doing things. Uh, we have two current science laboratories at downtown. We'll be adding these two at Midtown. Right now we have no laboratory specialist for that area. Uh, I think we've got to have a full-time person uh, budgeted position because we need the consistency in inventory, the consistency in safety, and we will be using these spaces as learning support center areas uh, until we get enough of the models and things that we need in the campus learning support center. And these uh, laboratory specialists can help students in that area as well. That cost is about $34,000. Um, back to Bay Pines. This is another, I thought, nice picture of the, of the site. Uh, we think the building is probably going to go where you see the yellow area there in the front and the trees behind that, sort of up near those trees. Uh, we're, we are, as I said, very close to having uh, an updated design to, to share with everyone. Uh, obviously, if we are hoping, and I think this will probably begin construction this summer, uh, the plans are supposed to be ready by July, so I would assume that by August or September we will start. So sometime during this next academic year, we're going to need a director, and I'm requesting a combination administrative and laboratory support person to, to help that director. Um, um, the director is an executive director. You can see here briefly some of the responsibilities. Keep in mind, please, that the center is not just, it is a place for our classes. Whoops. It is a place for our classes, but it's also a place for us to bring the community. And I think it's important that we get the executive director hired before the center is built uh, so that we can have that person in the community beginning to make those relationships to bring our community partners into the center when it does come on board. Uh, I costed that out based on some of the descriptions of other positions in the salary schedule as a, I think it's a grade seven at 85,000. Uh, we're not going to have separate laboratory and administrative services people there. I'd like to have one person uh, that can do both the management of the laboratories and help with the operation of the laboratories as well as giving some administrative support to the executive director. I think this is a bit higher position than perhaps if they were separate and so I've made that as a uh, $53,000 uh, area. Um, we will have classes there, but we're also going to have lots of other activities going on. We're going to have two laboratories that, again, are learning laboratories, not, not classrooms, but places where people can do things. And we're also going to have three individual research group laboratories uh, that will need to be managed. I believe we can probably get six to nine different laboratory groups working at any one given time in there. So the total cost there is about 138000 And uh, I thought I'd close by showing you some more outdoors. These are red mangroves that line the property down there and to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sharon Setterlin, Dean of the College of Computer and Information Technology, and I have submitted three budget requests for the 2015-16 year. The first one is entitled Student Engagement Learning Lab. What we're looking at here is offering a blended format for students in the classroom. Sometimes it's referred to as the flip classroom, where students will have um, assignments that they will do out of class and then come into class and work in a lab environment. And this uh, lab would be at the new building, the new ethics, social science, and CCIT building up in Clearwater. Right now, the, the way that the computer lab is set up, it's a traditional lecture delivery with neat rows and single stations, and, what we, and they're facing the lecturer and or the instructor. What we're proposing is a learning environment more on a collaborative style than the traditional, where the desks are set up in a pod so that four students will be facing each other. 
What we'd like to do is have a collective format. The instructor can move around the room, assist students, but more so the students can help each other in this type of a format as they're facing each other. And that, um, it was $24,000 we were asking for that. The second thing we're looking at is Learning Resource Center. What I'd like to do is, could you move that? Or do I click it? I'm sorry. Okay. What I'd like to talk about now is an, um, a Learning Resource Center internship model that I would like to pilot this year so that now that the increase in our internships have risen to uh, 35 to 40 students we, were going to, we will have in the fall, I would like to set up a model to start setting up some support that we can give the college. Where I'd like to start would be in the learning resource centers. As you can see from the data that I have um, received from Joe Leopold, look at the number of students that actually come into these centers uh, from last year and again in the fall. And what's happening uh, from what Joe is telling me is that these students Almost 50% of these students are requesting some sort of computer support. So I would like to set up a model where we get five interns for these five learning resource centers at 20 hours a week, and I'd like them to be a paid internship for the students. And that model would come out to about 32000 for the year. The final request that I have is for an instructional technology specialist. We're requesting a new full-time instructional technology position to really to provide user support and training for students and faculty that are using, utilizing all of the technical resources of the department. One of the major um, resources that we have is for the Gateway course the, we have um, 70 plus sections of the CGS 1100 course. We have 55 instructors. This is just in a semester, which services over 200 students. And what needs to happen is that we need to actually have someone, a, and, and now it has been falling on the academic chair, to go out and actually add students, instructors, we have to update start and stop times every year, uh, every semester for these programs. So that is an administrative task there. Also, we are dealing as that person becomes the liaison between the student and instructors for the vendor so that if there's any issues, that is be uh, being taken care of by this person. We also have implemented a web server this year. For all of our students that are in the web development AS program, what we have now is a place where students coming in can actually store their websites as they work towards their final product in the final course of the web development AS degree. We also now have four courses that are going live in the fall in our virtual lab environment. All of these particular servers and or um, uh, virtual environments require administratively, people have to set students up, set up instructions, uh, instructors, and they also have to serve in some sort of a user support capacity. The final thing that I'm looking at is a product called You Certify. And this product can interface with the D2L, and it will allow for us to embed industry certifications into all of our courses. This will provide unlimited test preps all the way through from the beginning to the end of the course, and then students will take the course. So that's going to be implemented in the fall. So I'm, I'm requesting an instructional technology specialist that can help with all of the technical resources of our department. Thank you. And are there any questions? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Susan Demers, and this morning I am here as a line member of the Seminole Educational Ecosystem. 
All three of my requests were spurred by my participation in that project. The first one is uh, to ask that we sequester some funds. Um, the number I picked, strictly arbitrarily, was $2,000 per principal for each of the 17 principals in our school district so that principals and provosts could work together to identify students who might not otherwise be considered scholarship recipients, but who the principals and the associate principals know to be people who need the encouragement of that financial incentive. Um, I just want to take two seconds and testify. My husband came from a really, really tough family background. And if some high school teacher, associate principal, and counselor had not stopped him in the hall one afternoon and asked him where he was going to college, and he wasn't, he didn't have any transportation to DBCC, he wouldn't. I'm sure he would have had a great career in Publix. He's a, he works really, really hard. And he was their head bag boy, even though he had a broken leg. But the fact of the matter is, those people changed his life that afternoon because they had the discretion. They called Stetson. Stetson had a scholarship that they had open for Wonderland High School student. And everything changed for him and the thousands of lives that he uh, touched. I'm not going to say every criminal defendant that whose life he touched uh, applauds that decision, but all right. Uh, anyway, my point is that kind of discretion is powerful and changes people's lives. So I encourage that scholarship. The second is also a scholarship request. This is a little bit different. This is for our elite educator program. And this actually comes out of a series of conversations we had this semester with one of the associate principals at Seminole High School who knew two young men who needed to be in our elite educator program. She tracked us down, she pointed it out, and one of them is currently enrolled in the program as a result of it. I think it would be great if we reached out um, really intentionally and identified students. This would be a great way to build traction with the public school system, build some trust with the school system. And you know the beautiful part of our elite educator program is they're going back to that school system. They have a guaranteed job at the end of it. So this would sequester some dollars for that. Um, it's kind of skimpy in terms of the total amount if you think of what it would take to educate a student through the two years plus two years. But as I've learned to my sorrow, sometimes it's difficult to give money away if scholarship is, uh, is attached to it. So I think it's a start, and that's the important thing. And finally, my last request is for, um, I guess you would say, materials development funds. Because one of the things that we have found working with the Seminole educational ecosystem is that there, there's, a, there's a break in communication. And the break in communication happens right about the junior year because here's what happens. All those former counselors are busy working with test scores. And so the information about college, college readiness, academic programs, what a so, I'm talking to students, you know, one of our most popular uh, transfer degree programs to USF is interdisciplinary social science. Our students leave here, they go over to USF, they do extraordinarily well. But here's the problem. There are very few Pinellas High, high School juniors who know what social science is. So there's a huge gap to be bridged there, and we need some funds to develop some academic information materials. These are not really marketing materials. It's us reaching back to the students of Pinellas County and helping them make that decision. In the end, it's marketing because we'll get their brothers, their sisters, and their parents if we don't get this particular kid. But it's also our duty as citizens of Pinellas County. Thanks so much. Good morning to each of you. This budget request of 35000 will support the creation of the Center of Student Civic Learning and <coughs> Community Engagement to be located at the Midtown campus to serve students throughout the county. Civic engagement and service learning experiences can contribute to 
higher levels of student success, there are no questions. Can contribute to retention, really no questions. Can, in fact, contribute to graduation rates, there's no question. Therefore, we are e expanding the number of civic engagement and service learning experiences for our students on all of our campuses. We will, in fact, then generate the level of energy and the level of ideas and the level of strategies to, in fact, to expand it to all of our campuses, impacting all of our students. Moving a new level of civic engagement, community engagement, is vital in helping SPC to achieve the goals of the college experience. The creation of the center will provide more structure. It will provide more framework. And it will certainly provide a, a, the way for us to be able to coordinate the various opportunities that we'll be providing for all of our students. Now, the center's programs will engage students and faculty with Pinellas County communities through a range of civic outreach, because there's a threefold component here, impacting through civic outreach, impacting through service learning, and volunteer community opportunities for our students. It's a three-pronged way that you can involve students in the, in the community in that respect. And we will be actively involved in getting our students involved in each of those areas throughout the, can, uh, throughout the county, impacting all of our campuses. We have developed some civic engagement projects that have been shared around the state as best practices. We've committed significant time to developing those strategies that we believe will be effective in impacting our students in such a way that if it's structured properly, it will have a threefold effect that we had, we had mentioned. We believe them to be best practices, and we're sharing those around the state, and we believe through this particular center that we'll be able to frame more best practices uh, to impact our students. To expand the effort that can contribute to achieving higher levels of student retention, higher success among our students, and higher completion. We know then that completion is a catchword that somehow or the other, if it's not tied to that, it doesn't roll so well. So the fact of the matter is, in this case, we can clearly see how this would be connected to that because at the end of the day, the impact of it overall will invariably show higher levels of completion among our students. We request your support of investment of 35000 for the creation of the Center for Civic Learning and Community Engagement. And I close by saying this. It will have a threefold impact. It's threefold. Where you can say the college benefits because of it. Number one, clearly student success. Student success not only in terms of their opportunity here with us, because they're only here for, with us for a season. The reality is that once the season is over, they've got to go on somewhere else. And we're hoping and trusting that their experience with us will not only impact them for the season that they're with us, but throughout a lifetime of civic involvement and engagement that every good citizen ought be able to claim that they're doing. And if they're not doing, then shame on them. So then first of the threefold impact would be impact on student, a positive impact there. And then secondly, it further enhances the image of the college. If you know anything about the national report that just came out, the crucible moment, you know it was a scathing report against higher education. But the reality is we believe then by doing this will not only impact the image of our college in a general kind of way, but we believe, Dr. Law, that it will impact the image of the college among all of the communities of Pinellas County. And, and, and at the end of the day, we're, we're still a community college. It's all about communities. And so then that being the case, we believe that the communities around this county will see us in a different light as our students are planted throughout the county doing wonderful things in that regard. And then thirdly and finally, communities will benefit from the many hours of service given by our students and faculty in their civic engagement, in their volunteering, and in their service learning. And so then, Dr. Law, we submit to you for your consideration in this case, $35,000 for the creation of this center. And I'm reasonably comfortable in saying I fundamentally believe that the college will indeed be pleased with the investment in this particular project. Good morning, Jonathan Steele's my name. I'm the Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts. 
my first request is for a, an increase of the 25-hour uh, OPS instructional assistant position at Seminole Campus to full-time instructional support specialist. Digital arts program at Seminole has experienced tremendous growth as reflected on this chart from 147 in, in uh, the fall of 2009 to um, this current semester 319, which represents 217% growth over six years. Uh, this has been a critical need for the past three years, and enrollment and the resulting activity just continue to increase. It provides needed instructional assistance to students and faculty. It serves multiple needs of camera and equipment checkout, lab support, software support, video production and studio operation, and uh, digitorium support. Um, it provides crucial in, uh, support for the internship placement. And, uh, We've, we've, al we've always been about workforce in these programs, but the, the focus is clearly on effective workforce training, including internship development, industry certification, and, and job placement, and real workforce experiences. And to that end, we've, we've changed the digital arts program in the past couple of years to make the internship a requirement instead of an option, and we're facilitating uh, training in the in industry certifications, and this position is critical to have the full-time support for that as the students practice on the labs. It also provides uh, ex essential support for uh, student success in general, which will then in improve our graduation rates. And um, uh, the graduations, I don't know if the slide is here. Uh, I don't know. Wait, I, I would just note that uh, we've, we've gone from... Um, Last year, we've gone from 24 graduates uh, 2011 to 25 graduates 2012, 43 graduates in 2013, a jump there, and already 17 graduates uh, just past fall. Most graduates come in the spring, so we expect that to grow. This position really facilitates getting students ready to graduate, helping them complete. Um, it's just one more support. Uh, our next position is uh, the next, I'm not, getting this to work. It's um, our current 25-hour OPS position in, in photography support, much of the same benefits that we've just talked about. You might say, why, why request a 20-hour position when you have 25? Because the two reasons, um, uh, it, all the same reasons I've just stated for digital arts, plus uh, the, the stability that this brings. The main cost of this would be, would be the health care provision, about $8,100, according to Jim uh, Nozowicz. And um, it, uh, it would be a higher pay rate of $15.58 per hour, which, which makes a difference. And that would be a guaranteed 20 hours rather than up and down based upon the teaching. Most, m most times, as we have now, our OPS person is a teaching faculty member. And there's a value of having a credentialed faculty member in that position to provide the content uh, to specific support in labs. And so this would allow that person to teach without impacting his part-time hours. And it, it, it really just provides, it's a commitment to stability of the program. It's, you know, it's a budgeted position rather than a part-time position. So those are our two requests and I thank you for your attention.